Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the, the webinar we're doing today. Um, we have Brian Soliday with us, who's the, um, the Chief Revenue Officer of Voxel Maps. So I'll hand over to, to Brian to do the introductions. Thanks. Pre appreciate that, Peter. So um, what we'd like to do, we'd like to initially welcome you to uh, the Voxel Maps webinar series. So this is the very first webinar in a series of four that we're putting on. And um, the series is called Enhanced Decision Making via uh, Voxel Based 4D Biometric Digital Twins. All right. So, uh, what we'd like to do is to, uh, you know, go over a number of activities and case studies and projects that we've done. We'd also, we're also going to get into a little bit about um, the overall. Uh, the overarching structure of the organization. So Peter's going to give us an overview of Voxel Maps, talk a little bit about Maps for Machines, which are really, for a lot of the people that are attending, is, is really a new concept, right? Um, and so Peter will talk about the way that we collect the data and process it is really geared towards uh, machine learning and, and using that technology. Uh, a little bit of volumetric mapping one, 101. So again, it's a somewhat unique to a lot of people. A lot of people don't know what voxels are and how they can be used and Going to kind of dig into that. Um, talk about our data collection tools and systems and uh, the process that we do that. Um, an exciting topic today will be uh, a briefing on this 100 cities uh, DAS data set that uh, we're embarking on in terms of a very, uh, very extensive data collection across the US. Um, I'll come back on and uh, we'll review some industry use cases and then we have questions. So if you do have questions, um, down at the bottom of the of uh, your display is a Q and A button, and that's where you can just go ahead and just type in any questions that you have. We'll address those at the end of the uh, at the end of the event. Um, we're recording the session as well, and we'll be providing this to everyone after the event. So um, I just ask you know please feel free to pass this along to your colleagues uh, that couldn't make that. Food. Okay. So with that, I would uh, like to introduce. Uh, the CEO of Voxel Maps, Mr. Peter Atala. Thank you, Brian. Thanks, everybody. It's great to, to be here today and have the opportunity to tell you a little bit about what we're doing at, at Voxel Maps. Um, so I'm going to get started just by giving a little bit of background uh, on the company. So um, the company is actually a spin out from a previous mapping company that uh, I founded back around 2007. That company was called NavMe, and, and NavMe was a very early navigation the mapping company, we mapped 180 countries around the world, which is almost the whole world. It was a huge project um, involving about 7 billion kilometers of data and tens of thousands of people over a 10 year period uh, to build. But about five years ago, we had a division of that business that was really thinking about the future of mapping. And that really became Voxel Maps. So we spun out of, uh, of NavMe, we set up, we're headquartered in San Francisco. Uh, but we, we've grown you know, quite well since we did that. So San Francisco is the headquarters, but we have offices in Latin America, in Mexico City, uh, in the UK, in Nottingham, in Porto, in Portugal, and Singapore and Australia as well. So we, we're about at 350 people um, in quite a big growth phase uh, in terms of what we do and how we deliver. Still, the majority of the work, the majority of the focus is very much on the US and North America. And uh, we'll be giving you some, some great examples of some of the work that we're doing. So I want to begin by just talking about this concept that Brian mentioned around maps for machines, which is really the, the focus of what we do here at Voxel Maps. So starting, you know, what's the difference between a human map versus a machine map? So human maps, we're, we're all used to. We use them in our phones and in our cars or on the web. And they're really around a, a kind of a use case of navigating people to an address, whether that's a city or a street or a building. That's you know, the, the primary use case. The secondary use case is very much around visualization. So, you know, so we're, where we're taking some form of geo data and we're placing it on a map uh, to visualize. The majority of the data for humans is 2D. There are some 3D aspects, but still it's pretty small and it's pretty low resolution. So we're talking one to three meters in terms of accuracy. And for most human applications, that's totally fine. We can decide where we want to walk or where we want to drive. But when we start to look at machines, they have a different requirement in terms of the mapping and the map data. So really, machine maps are very much around creating models. So we're creating true 3D spatial models of the environment, everything that we're mapping. 
And so subsequently, we're analyzing everything that we can see in a given environment. So in urban areas and cities, that can be infrastructure, telecoms, utilities, but in non-urban environments, that can be things like vegetation, land structures, for example. And we're doing this at very high resolutions, so one to four centimeters. And at that kind of resolution, it's not just about the location of the objects, but also about the additional information we can pull out based on those objects. So measurements, features, attributes, which are obviously very important. So when we talk about machines, we're talking about everything from computer models and artificial intelligent models to better understand cities and environments, all the way through to future forms of autonomy. So things like autonomous cars, delivery robots, AMRs, which are automated miniature robots, drones, uh, for example. And the requirement for this, this data is everywhere. So obviously the biggest use case is typically outdoor, but there's indoor use cases, there's subterranean, there's even a need for, for ocean data as well in the future, and that's, that's one of the things. So I wanna take some time just to introduce the concept of volumetric mapping and what voxels are as well. So the starting point for this is to have a look at you know, 3D maps as they stand today. So this is an example from Google, but you can see very similar products from Apple or here, for example, or, or Mapbox. Um, and this map is a great map for, for humans to visualize. It's an approximate visualization of a city. It looks great, um, but when you actually zoom in and look at these structures, they're pretty low resolution. So really this map is built up of these very basic 3D objects with some kind of a texture and a mesh um, you know, placed on it. So using a mesh is great as a visualization tool, but if we really want to get detail, if we want to see what's inside, uh, for example, the building, there's nothing there, it's just empty. And that's because when we're looking at 3D mesh technology, meshes are only really focused on one aspect of physical matter, and that's the surface information. They're not really concerned with the interior information. And even if you were to try and map the interior and create another mesh, trying to get these two meshes to merge together is actually very complicated very manual in a lot of ways, and subsequently requires a lot of pre-processing work to, to try and do this. Volumetric mapping is very different. Uh, essentially, we use an approach which uses voxels, which I'll introduce on the next slide. But essentially what we're doing is we're able to map not only the physical surfaces uh, of matter of cities, but also the interior information in the same model. And it's designed in such a way that this data can be automatically collected automatically processed and dropped straight into the model. So that has the ability then to have real-time updates uh, of the data without having to do a lot of pre-processing as well, while still maintaining very high accuracy, one to four centimeters, and also adding a fourth dimension of time to be able to do things like change detection. So the technology that, that we have uh, is based around voxels. Um, I'm sure some of you might've heard of voxels, and voxels by themselves are not necessarily new technology. Uh, voxel is just a volumetric pixel, essentially it's a cube. And voxels have been used in, uh, in computer games for a long time. So for example, Minecraft is an example of a voxel rendered uh, world. Um, but in particular, what we do is we use voxels in a configuration called a VOG or a voxel occupancy grid. And this technology really came out of uh, robotics. Uh, whereby you'd have a small kind of miniature robot with a 3D scanner, very often a LiDAR on top of it. And it would go and make a very basic 3D mesh of a room so it could navigate its way around. So we took this concept of VOGS, but we applied it onto a planetary level. So the technology is actually something called an MR VOG or a multi-resolutional voxel occupancy grid. So what we did is we placed the Earth or placed a giant mega voxel over the top of the planet. Now, this voxel is then uh, comprised of multi-resolutional voxels, which theoretically can be absolutely any size, but for our purposes, we use eight meter voxels down to one centimeter voxels. So this 3D mesh goes straight through the planet. It goes through everything. Wherever you're sat at the moment is full of these uh, virtual voxels, straight through the, um, the earth, the oceans, the buildings. And it's something called an earth-centered, earth-fixed model. And each voxel has a permanent position in space um, and it has a unique address. But to start with, it's blank. It's just a 3D or 4D geo reference frame. So what we do is we validate the occupancy status of the voxel. 
Basically, is it free space or is there something inside it? The main way we do this is using LiDAR sensors. So if the laser from the LiDAR passes through a voxel and is not reflected off anything, we label this as free space. But the moment that the laser is reflected off a surface, we label this as occupied. So in essence, what we're doing is etching out the matter of the planet. But because we're putting it into this voxel occupancy grid, at its core, it's a global spatial database for all of this uh, information. So it's what we call real time, it's persistent, it's always on. We don't view 3D data just as you know, some files you put into a 3D viewer or a games engine just to process them. This is designed to handle thousands of petabytes, really planetary scale data and being able to do the kind of analysis across the entire data set, not just small subsets of the data as well. The reason, one of the, the key reasons that we decided to, to really go with voxels over traditional technologies in 3D like points or meshes is some of the really smart features that, uh, that they have. So firstly, voxels are measurement units. So it's very easy to perform calculations in 3D uh, on any of the objects that we see, location, size, all of those things. But in addition to that, we can place additional layers of data on the surface of the voxels. So this really is an aspect of color. This can be RGB values from cameras. It could be hyperspectral imagery. It could even be things like radar. So once you've got the shape of things made out of the voxels, you've got the surface information, which gives an aspect of color, we can then get um, our artificial intelligence platform to start looking at the voxels in 3D and recognizing the objects and perform calculations and measurements. And this is truly done in 3D. It's not some kind of 2D image-based segmentation. We're really looking at the objects in 3D, but not only in 3D. So we can look at you know, what is there at the moment, but then each voxel has an infinite number of time states. So we have this temporal data component. And that means that we can get the AI to also look at the data that has been there before and compare and contrast the two. So it gives us the ability to do some quite powerful change detection uh, in, the, in the, uh, the approach. And then when we combine this with the, the permit addressing, the global spatial database, the ability to intelligently search and pull back information, it becomes a really powerful platform for digital twins. It's really a superior technology for building a digital twin. So I wanna show you what this, this looks like. So to start with, this is the occupancy data alone. This uh, is all made out of voxels. And then on the surface of the voxels, we're putting the colors from the camera. And then we're getting the AI to do the recognition. So all of these pretty colors you see here is the AI automatically recognizing the feature and vectorizing it. And once we've done that, we can then play around with the data. We can remove the things we're not interested in or export them out into different formats or put them back and, and analyze everything. We have full flexibility to, uh, to, to explore the data sets that we have. We've currently trained the system to recognize about 100 different objects within cities. We'll be up to about 200 objects um, within the next three months or so. But we have the ability to train the system to recognize anything else that a customer might require, both outdoors and, and indoors. So around that, this is the, the bit where we really kind of engage with the, the artificial intelligence. So it's a platform we've built called Voxel Insights. So we take the Voxel data, and then when we apply the artificial intelligence, it gives us the, the insights. So this is a, an application that uh, we give to customers. They can access either on their desktop or by the web. There's even a virtual reality version and a, an AR version as well to, to use. But it's from this application that you can export all the data. So you can see here all of the colorful lines and boxes. The, this is a recognition event. So the AI is recognizing an object, is me measuring an object. And then you have the ability to export any size of data into any format that you want. But also from this, this platform, you have the ability then to do things like virtual surveys. So you have the ability to go into the data and explore it, even walk around the data if you have um, your VR headsets uh, as well. Another aspect is really on this 4D change detection, which I mentioned before. Um, so I just wanna mention an example, and, and Brian's gonna tell you more about this particular example as a customer use case as well. But this is just one uh, illustration of this 4D concept working. So here we have a pole 
and uh, the, the poll's been mapped numerous times, but there's been a new installation on the poll and the system is able to detect that new installation. If it's trained, it can tell you what the installation is um, and alert you to it. But even if it isn't trained, it can still detect the change and alert you that something has, has changed on there as well. So this has a lot of applications in terms of surveying compliance around infrastructure installations uh, as well. We also pro provide a lot of uh, tools to go with the data. We can uh, do the full training, we can do the full collection uh, for customers, but sometimes we like to give the customers flexibility as well. So in addition to the web interface, uh, we have the ability to provide AI training tools. So in this video, this is somebody marking up trees, it can be any object, um, which then is used to train the AI. And once the AI is trained, it can run through the entire data sets and pull back the features uh, that, that people are looking for. So it's a really powerful and flexible um, application. There. So that was the underlying technology, that was the, the insight. Um, I'm gonna talk for a few moments really on the data collection side and how we collect this data. So we have our own mobile mapping solution. Uh, it's a device called Simbo. And essentially we've really designed this to be easy to deploy and scale on mass, you know, in terms of going out and mapping entire cities, states, even, even countries as well. So the device is designed to be installed onto any vehicle that has a rack. Um, it's about a 10 minute install for one person. Um, at the end of the day, it takes five minutes to take off the vehicle and it can be stored in a Pelican case. And that's very useful in terms of handling the logistics. Um, you know, in terms of if you're driving around the city uh, or driving around the state, you have the flexibility of moving these devices around very, very easily as well. The other nice thing inside this device, uh, we have LiDAR, we have cameras, we have high accuracy uh, GPS and IMUs uh, with the ability to use things like RTK, PPK. It's also powered by NVIDIA graphics cards, which means it does all of the processing on the edge. You don't need to connect this to another computer. In fact, the only thing you need to operate this is an iPad. Um, and if there is 5G connection, you can have the ability as well to actually stream the data in real time off the device in 5G. Now, the majority of 5G installations aren't you know, across the whole of the country yet. So um, if, if there's no 5G, you still have the ability to manually take out and swap the, uh, the hard drives and, and process the data that way. So with some customers, we will do all of the collection ourselves and we will just deliver you know, a product to them. With other customers, they're also interested in actually doing some of the collection work themselves. In addition to the hardware, there are a number of tools which start to make it a lot easier to do mapping and mapping missions. And so we have a backend system which is really designed to look at an area. Again, it can be anything from a city all the way up to a country and to divide that the area up into daily mapping missions for operators. And once that's cut up, it allows then the, the missions to be sent directly to the users, the, the operators of the device, which they get to see on their iPads, they get to select uh, the mission that they want to go and you know, how they want to go and map. And it gives them guidance in terms of making it an optimized route for collecting data. And so once they've accepted the mission, this is the interface they see on the iPad which just gives a very kind of nice user-friendly interface in terms of whether the system's working, if all of the green lights are on, everything's good. You have the ability then to see the data as it's being collected. If everything is green, uh, there's no problems. But if there are problems, then the line that, that you leave as you're driving will change to, to amber or to red. And that's really important because if there are problems with the data, you have the ability to go back and collect there and then versus working out much later you know, in post-processing that there's some errors with the data as well. So there's a lot of flexibility. There's lots of tools as well to be able to troubleshoot should you ever need to. And because of the connection that these devices have, we have the ability as well to remotely support as well. So we can remotely connect to the de device and um, do any kind of support that might be needed as well. It's a really powerful and kind of flexible uh, product. So when we add all of these things together, I mean, you know, what are the, the key benefits for using uh, Voxel's technology? So firstly, it allows you to map much faster, you know, creating maps and digital twins and extracting assets incredibly quickly. 
it's not about just mapping where these things are. It's also about pulling back insights. So even when we're recognizing objects such as streetlights, it, you know, it's not just the measurements, we're pulling back 14 or 15 different attributes and features. So you get an exceptionally rich data set um, without having to put in a lot of work. Essentially the, the majority of the, the work and the heavy lifting is done by the insights platform and the artificial intelligence. And so all of that combined means that you can reduce costs. Um, you know, one machine replaces the need of a, a lot of the standard survey approach that we see very often in this, these kind of mapping exercises. And the fact that it can all be operated by one person, not having to have two people in a vehicle or two people to set up a system, just means it's easier as well to deploy. But most importantly, creating the digital twin using voxel maps means that you're mapping everything that, as you go through it, even if you're ju just interested in a few assets. So you have the ability later on to go in and to extract, automatically extract additional features and additional assets, which may be needed that maybe you didn't even know uh, were required at the time. So it gives you this kind of full flexibility. Just before I hand uh, back over to Brian, I want to tell everybody about a, a really exciting program that we've got on at the moment um, around, we call it the 100 cities uh, model. It's a data as a service model. So we have different ways of operating. Uh, one way is that we will go out and do mapping missions and you know, map an area for clients. Another way is that we are mapping ourselves and we have that data to be able to, to resell. So starting this year and into next year, we are mapping 100 of the top uh, cities or metro areas around the US. And so this is a full Voxel 3D digital twin of those areas, but it also includes data such as the LiDAR point cloud, the high resolution imagery, and we break it down in terms of the road networks. And we also extract all of the features that, uh, that I was showing you before into a vectorized data set. So it's very easy to export out into different formats. And we can deliver all of that data either through our web interface, so the data as a service model, um, or if it's a large amount of data, if people want entire cities or you know, states, for example, then we have the ability to send that you know, via things like uh, Amazon S3 or even FTP or physical hard drives if, if required. So again, if, if those, um, we, we'll be very happy to share a list of those cities, but it's, if it's of interest, then we can definitely send you data samples and uh, it'd be really great to look at some of the use cases. So with that, I'm gonna hand back over to Brian um, to continue with the next part of, uh, of the webinar. Thank you very much. Thanks, Peter. So, um, so Peter gave us a really good overview of the whole concept of maps for machines and 4D volumetric mapping. And, and uh, we're really excited about this 100 Cities project. What I'd like to do is to talk a little bit about some applications and use cases of the technology that we've seen and we're interacting with uh, both customers as well as prospects. The, um, there's a number of use cases. So uh, it, uh, it doesn't have to be in one particular uh, industry. So these are just some, you know, types of applications that we're, you know, that we're supporting. So, you know, on the utility side, it could be joint use for um, transportation organizations that may be ADA compliance, right? Or urban gutter or uh, local governments for signage inventory or disaster assess assessment or public works that may be interested in drainage for, uh, for stormwater runoff. So there's lots of different applications um, that the, the Voxel data and Voxel technology is being used in today. The uh, couple of a couple of projects that we've done. So in this case, it was a uh, a company that wanted a collection of traffic signs uh, throughout a general area. This happened to be in the San Francisco area, um, and they're a, a navigation mapping company. And so what we did was we uh, took our systems, drove the streets, and then we did a automated uh, sign recognition uh, collection or extraction, I should say, using the, the Voxel Maps AI ML technology, uh, and then exported all that to, to XML for delivery to the customer. Key thing here is that over 7 million uh, signs were actually mapped as part of this process. So uh, quite, a few, quite a few signs. Um, I think this kind of shows too that to our ability to uh, scale for larger projects or, you know, whether it's a, a small municipality 
or whether it's a, a huge statewide organization or a nationwide collect, um, we've been involved in those sorts of use cases up to this point in time. Um, another use case is installation compliance. So uh, this had to be a local government. Um, they wanted to look at uh, a change detection on existing assets. So if you remember the slide that Peter talked to with the, the voxel structure and this whole 4D capability, in this case, it was very valuable because we had an existing data set that the customer had collected, put that into the uh, voxel structure, and we drove the area and then took that data into the voxel structure and did a simple change detection. So being able to identify places where new signage, maybe, uh, you know, work on a uh, on an intersection where there was, you know, different curbs put in for what we talked about before, ADA compliance, but it also allowed for automatic measurements as well, automated measurements. So you can know if a, uh, a sign within the right-of-way is a little too large for the, uh, the zoning restrictions. So, and that really is the non-compliance. So using it to not only support identification, but non-compliance across the local government organization. Um, lots of example use cases across the whole uh, automated asset mapping and the city infrastructure. So, um, you know, we're data agnostic. So, you know, up in the upper right hand corner, you know, some uh, the data that we drove and merged it with some existing 3D models that have been taken via, uh, via LIDAR. So there's lots of different use cases on the, on the whole infrastructure side, whether it's, you know, looking at pavements, the right of way, you know, could be cities looking at uh, health of trees uh, within their right of way and the type of trees, and the volume of those trees and potential um, uh, vegetation management issues in that case. Uh, another area where we've done a lot of work is road network mapping. Um, so we did some work for a major automotive company. Um, you know, it's, it's a lot of miles uh, that we drove last year. Uh, we drove just over 650,000 miles in the U.S. last year uh, on a project. And so that's about uh, 50 times to the moon and back. It's, it's a lot of driving, or excuse me, 50, mile, 50 times around the, uh, the equator, sorry. Um, but that's a lot of driving. So we, you know, we can scale up and, and get uh, Boxer Maps team members out in the field to do this and collecting, you know, uh, not, not quite 24 seven, but substantial amount of uh, time. And then for this particular customer, we were looking at creating uh, HD maps for autonomous vehicles. And I'll talk a little bit about that later, but, you know, creating the road lane model, identification of traffic signs and striping in the roadway, et cetera. And then uh, uh, providing that to the customer for their use in their uh, HD map uh, recorded application. Everybody, not everybody, but most people are talking about smart cities and, and there's lots of capability, lots of use cases within the smart cities area where, where the uh, voxel technology can really be leveraged. So, you know, traffic monitoring. Good thing about LiDAR is it doesn't need to be light out. So you could use that to monitor traffic, you know, as they go through intersections or along a major road, motorway uh, day and night. You can also use it to identify vehicle type and, you know, Smart cities can use this data to identify where they have some specific uh, problems with uh, with traffic. It can also be used as uh, in, in pedestrian monitoring. So, you know, using it to identify high pedestrian traffic locations. This could be with LIDAR, but it also can be, you know, integrating LIDAR with the, uh, the, mo the mobile phone usage as well. Um, they can use it to identify where they need to put in more sidewalks, et cetera, and then, in today's world with the, these pandemics, you know, uh, where social distancing is required, needed, they can also use this technology to help monitor pedestrians and, and make recommendations to uh, use alternate routes. And then in the area of security management, so, you know, real-time detection, and tracking of people and assets or vehicles, you know, like a, like a public works, you know, we want to keep track of all their assets. Um, and then, you know, in the, uh, you could actually fine tune the LIDAR as well for uh, like perimeter uh, alarms. So if somebody moves into that area, you can actually use the LIDAR to do a really quick change detection to identify if somebody is uh, inside the fence. So 
And then um, in the area of digital twins, so there's, you know, lots of, of different applications across. I, I really, I, I can't think of a, of an industry that could not use digital twins. So this is a, my, uh, an area of significant growth across, you know, city mapping or, uh, you know, disaster management, cover and response or construction monitoring or updating base maps data or uh, urban environmental changes. Um, you know, there's there's uh, the new infrastructure bill uh, that's that is expected to be passed uh, has about forty five billion dollars in there, I think, for uh, geospatial oriented uh, requirements that the government has and governments have. Um, and so I'll just I'll throw this out right now, but we put together a, a program guidebook that you'll receive a link to um, that that has some information about the webinars. But it also has a number of pages that talk to uh, the infrastructure bill that's coming up and what it means for geospatial. So I, I think everyone on this call, uh, I would take the time to read those four pages because there's lots of opportunity for, for everyone here in terms of leveraging some of this infrastructure funding to help us do better planning and build digital twins. Another area uh, that was mentioned by Peter earlier on is this whole uh, uh, area of, of uh, there's something on my screen. Uh, the this whole indoor visual positioning or BPS and using that for automated miniature robots. Um, and so, what I've seen is that you know not only are we worried about collecting the digital twins of the external of the building but also the internal working. So I do have a quick demo here I'd like to show. Let's move it up a little bit. And so you can see this is the bottom picture is the voxelized image uh, using the RGB values and in real time colorizing the, uh, the model. The upper left is the actual imagery being taken by the robot. And the upper right is you can see it scanning in real time, coming in, scanning the entire office, backing out, you know, there's lots of different uh, capabilities for, uh, for people to use this, um, especially in, in uh, you know, in indoor environments. It can be, it can be a miniature robot like this. I've seen people use uh, backpacks as well. So there are lots of different uh, capabilities to, uh, to use this for a number of applications. On the, on the utility side, you know, like things like asset inventory. So using, uh, in this case, the asset capture was done via aerial wire. So uh, as Peter mentioned, you know, we're data agnostic, or I should say source agnostic, because it really doesn't matter where the content comes from. We can use that, consume that within the, the voxel 40 volumetric mapping structure, and then provide a quality output product to the customer. Um, we did, in this case, we, we consumed the aerial LiDAR data um, and then uh, used our AI ML automated feature extraction to actually pull out uh, different types of poles, lines, substations, et cetera, and then validate that against the, the actual uh, spatial database that that particular customer had. Another area, too, of significant interest is the whole vegetation management. Um, you know, this has been pushed forward uh, by a lot of utility organizations based on uh, issues that uh, several of the uh, investor-owned utilities in California had with vegetation touching wire. Um, so you can see here we have a, a, uh, the upper right-hand corner. This is a picture of the, uh, of the street that we drove down. Uh, using the, the symbol system collected. This is the imagery itself. And then we took the LIDAR and RG, and put the RGB value of every voxel in there. And then we can use that to do extraction. So here we've extracted the poles, we've extracted wires, we've extracted the veg. And then you can identify and create buffers around the uh, conductor lines to find out where there's vegetation encroachment within that. And then what's nice is that I can then you know, buffer and overlay, use that to determine any encroachment issues, but then I have the back end data to quantify that vegetation. I can take that data, hand it off to um, my teams that would, you know, then uh, deploy a, a truck out there to do some vegetation removal. But before they even hit the 
hit the street, they know how much vegetation and where uh, and on along what conductor wires need to be uh, need to be worked on. Um, there's also this uh, whole area of uh, you know in, in vegetation management, as I mentioned, and, and this is an interesting one here in the lower right. Uh, you can see here where we've actually pulled out the vegetation that's you know was too close to the wire just to give a uh, a view. So each one of these uh, each one of these could be just basically a, a layer of data that you could use to um, do quantification of where the issues are. So again, the same sort of thing. You drove the area, did the extraction. Uh, the lower left here, you can see where we found everything red in the, in the vegetation layer is where we saw where we saw uh, vegetation encroachment. So it's a uh, significant industry across most municipalities and, and utility companies. I had mentioned before uh, change detection. So in this case, it was a uh, 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 change detection on telecommunications equipment. So in this case, the customer, uh, we had a database of data that we had collected in their service area. Um, and then they had a number of 5G antennas that got, uh, got placed on poles. And so all they were looking for is identify the new assets being the antennas and on which particular pole, right? And so we went out and did the, the secondary collect, did the automated extraction in this case, you see here in the middle, pulling out that, uh, that particular object and then using that to, uh, to validate what had been done and validate it against the contractor's work orders. So um, it's, a very, it's a great tool to use uh, for them to identify areas of compliance, non-compliance and location of new assets. You know, in this case, you know, it could have been that they put it on the wrong pole and they actually wanted that, that antenna on the, the, the pole to the right facing the other direction. So, you know, it's a, it's a great compliance tool for uh, that particular customer. And then we've seen lots of interest in the telecommunications uh, or organizations to talk about using digital twins to identify and validate signal strength. So in this case, you know, building a digital twin of geography. And so we did both external and internal. Uh, so uh, their, their uh, office building, we went in and did some, did some data collection inside, but we also drove the outside as well. So we create this true digital twin. Um, and then we ran the signal attenuation and propagation models uh, from those five known 5G asset uh, antenna locations and used it to try to determine gaps. And, and again, this was both internal and external. So inside of the building based on nearness to windows or whether it's an interior office, et cetera, they were able to identify where they had uh, coverage issues. So it's a really good model for them to, uh, to use to provide their customers with a, a higher service. And then the automated HD map creation. So in this case, you know, collecting very high resolution data that can be used for, uh, for the autonomous vehicles. So signage, heights of bridges, things like that. So in the HD map itself, um, you, you know, you could you'd have the dimensions, et cetera, of your car within the system, and it'll tell you whether or not you can you know, drive that uh, delivery truck through that through that tunnel or down the street because of low hanging wires. Uh, so there's lots of lots of different capabilities on the uh, on the autonomous vehicle side. And autonomous vehicles in the smart city concept is something you're going to see more and more and more uh, across, across most municipalities. So. Uh, we could have autonomous vehicles capturing LIDAR could actually replace some area collections. I don't, it, it'll never uh, replace it all at, at all. I think it's a good complement to what the uh, aerial LIDAR collection. It's just that it can provide much more detailed content. And then this whole concept uh, that we're promoting called the constant collection element, or I call it C2N. So collecting and you know, in, re in real time, transmitting that information to a central database to provide road conditions and roadway systems to other vehicles. And then smart city connections in the city itself with this whole vehicle to everything. So 
using just the vehicle itself is just another IoT sensor. And it can be used for, you know, emergency management or, you know, relaying road hazards in the road, something you know, a, a rock fall or something like that. Um, very supportive of transportation planning. And then this area of smart parking, where the whole vehicle to everything and LIDAR could identify open spots and relay that information to existing automated vehicles and uh, navigate to open spots and save on, on fuel consumption. It was interesting in doing some research in the whole automated parking, there's about uh, four or five parking slots per vehicle in the United States. But it just seems like every time I go someplace, I can't find a place to spot to, to park in those. I also want to talk a little bit about HD map creation. So in today's model, um, you know, uh, organizations go out and do the road data collection. So they do the collection and harvesting via these HD mobile mapping sensor, uh, sensors. And then the many times those hard disk drives are physically shipped to a data center because uh, you know, the there's too much data to, to collect every day and, and upload. Um, so that's in the data centers where all the raw processing, data corrections, maybe PPK uh, corrections, and then putting that into a voxel data, um, the voxel data model. We can then do the uh, AI feature extraction and the feature vectorization and really create this high, um, this high definition HD map. And then updating that map display within the vehicles on the road. So that can take a significant amount of time. So. What we've seen is, you know, one to two weeks for this process and about a month for the getting, actually getting the data to the end customer, which, you know, if you think about that six weeks, um, that's actually a pretty short time period if you think about in the grand scheme of things. However, we had a customer who said, how can we change that model? What can we do? So we uh, engaged on a proof of concept with, uh, with uh, Verizon and Amazon Web Services. So in this case, um, same collection system, the Simbo that, uh, that Peter talked about earlier, but we put a Wi-Fi antenna on the Simbo. So we were able to um, do the collection. It was sent, the data was sent via, via Verizon's 5G Edge. Uh, at the facility, at the Verizon facility are the AWS Wavelength instance. So instead of having to hit the, the telecommunications and then across the internet to AWS, it's actually, the, the wavelength is actually on location at the, uh, at the, uh, the telco. We then um, took that data, being the, we, were, we were focused on the LIDAR side of things and created an updated map um, and delivered it back to the vehicle in 15 seconds. So collection through the, through the, uh, the 5G edge and wavelength, create the 3D model, back in the car, displayed in the vehicle, a full 3D model, and that became 15 seconds. So pretty significant turnaround from the six weeks to 15 seconds. So it's, it's, it's a very exciting area. Um, Peter was actually part of a, a presentation three or four weeks ago at Mo Mobile World Congress in, uh, in Barcelona with Verizon and AWS on this particular program. So let me just show you, this is the data it's just, it's coming in blocks. Um, obviously this isn't the speed at which our drivers were driving down the street, um, but it just shows you all the information that we were able to uh, collect and then automatically extract to get the roadways, all the poles, all the uh, utility lines, all the vegetation, et cetera, in a very quick and fast period of time. Like I said, within 15 seconds, um, it would uh, return that uh, the data to uh, the end customer. So we've covered a lot today. Um, you know, Peter gave us a, uh, a, a very solid overview of the voxel maps uh, as a company, talked about this whole concept of maps for machines and, and just asked, think about that. Think about that as you move forward is, you know, with everything going towards machine learning, is the data I'm collecting really the right data that, that my machine needs? Um, he then talked about the volumetric mapping and our technology, the data collection network, and then briefly discussed the 100 cities DAS data set. Um, 
I have then given some overview of some of the ind potential industry use cases. There's you know many, many more. we would love to talk to you about doing that. So um, what I'd like to do is I would like to open it up for questions. And we do have a number of questions. One, um, one was pr on pricing. So how do you price your, your product? So um, it's a pretty broad uh, pricing model that we, we can use. So uh, Peter mentioned, you know, the whole data as a service or FTP where we deliver that data to you. Um, that data can be licensed, meaning licensed to use, or you could have full ownership based on your project. And it kind of really depends upon how, how you want to work. And then we can price it by linear mile, which we do most often. But for some organizations, they say, we just want the light bulbs, right? We just want that. That's the only thing we want. So we can do a per asset model as well. It's really kind of up to you. So if there's, if there's an interest, let's uh, let's connect and, and talk a little bit about price. Um, a couple ones here. Uh, what about dynamic objects like people and autonomous vehicles? What is their address? So Peter, can you ad address that? Yeah, no, it's a really, really great question. So. One of the great things that, that we do, so as soon as the, the data is collected and converted into voxels, the, the uh, voxel insight platform not only extracts the features we're interested in, but it uses deep learning to remove the features we're not interested in. So by default, we remove people, we remove cyclists, cars, dogs, animals, etc., all from the scene automatically. And we don't do this using kind of very basic techniques like KF filters, which uh, can cause a lot of problems, a lot of errors. We're using deep learning to uh, to be able to do that. So in effect, they don't have an address. They're, they're, they're removed from the scene. Well, thank you. So um, since this one talked about people, um, um, Alex actually asked, it seems public identification and monitoring poses a serious privacy and security. Maybe it's more of a statement than a question. Yeah, maybe, maybe I can... A couple of yeah, I, that could be back to that use case I was talking about where you do, uh, you know, monitoring of people on the street and so. Yeah, so so generally speaking, particularly this is important depending on where you're collecting the data in the world. But there's definitely um, you know information bodies where you have to protect privacy. So even when you're collecting, doing a mapping collect, and um, you one remove the the people uh, or personally identifiable information such as number plates. Uh, from the scene. So you have uh, the ability that the platform actually also removes that, as I just mentioned, but it can do, it can remove that as well from imagery. Um, where you're monitoring people is a different use case. And so the client there has to be law enforcement or it has to be a government uh, body with permission to do that. Otherwise, obviously, that's, that's not allowed. Right. Um, another good question. Why does AI work better with voxels? Yeah, really good question. So it's not that it works better with voxels, it works best in 3D. So if you're looking at trying to detect an object and just using a flat 2D image and just you know using the pixels, that's, that's one thing. But if you really get the ability to look in 3D at objects, you get a much, much higher recognition. And so the, the approach, you've got two ways to recognize in 3D. We either train uh, to recognize points and point clouds but point cloud data can be very unruly. It's particularly if you're doing multiple passes of data, trying to get all the points to, to align becomes a very messy data set uh, over time. Um, or use something like voxels, which become you know, very powerful. So the fact is best than 2D recognition is because of the 3D versus uh, just using a 2D flat image. Great, thank you. Um, is, is our data natively consumable using Esri technology? Yes, and we're, we're an Esri partner as well. So we're building connections as well. So you, we can export out uh, into the format so you can use it directly to, in Esri. Uh, but very soon, we'll be connecting it via APIs as well. So it will be seamless between the platforms. OK. Um, another question, do you have pre-trained models ready? And how do you QC the outputs after the features have been extracted? Yeah, no, again, another really good question. So. Yes, absolutely. So I mentioned that the systems are already trained to recognize about 100 different assets in cities. Um, there's even more assets, actually, that we do uh, internally. So we have pre-trained models. 
Now, the, the training process is quite extensive on our side. So we have teams that go through and annotate the data in 3D, train the, the AI and the, the engine on training data sets, test data sets, where we get to validate the QA. So we have a very dedicated QA phase there as well. Then depending on the outputs, uh, we may introduce another level of QA, um, which might be required for our, for our customer, for example. Um, if you're training yourselves, which is totally an option, we, we provide tools to do that, and um, we would guide you through that process. But definitely, um, it's good to have QA as, as part of that. Okay. And then the follow-on to that was um, any specific tools that we have and do we process on the desktop or the cloud? So, so everything is processed. We have a, a private cloud and we have public clouds as well. And so the, uh, the data processing that we do is actually done on the private cloud. Um, but then once we've processed there, we store in public clouds and that's accessible then to, uh, to customers. The way that you can access it, you've got different, different routes. You can either use a web interface um, or you can use a desktop application. The desktop application is very good if you're doing training or doing a lot of exploring of the data in, in detail. Um, or even you know, virtual reality, for example, all of them still connect to, uh, to the same data set. All right. All right. Um, so if um, someone said they're, they're very interested in what, you know, how to best to contact you. So um, the two contacts, Peter or myself, feel free to reach out to us at the emails there. Um, we'll also, as part of the... Uh, the program guidebook that we'll be sending you a link to that will have our contact information. So you can um, here's a question. Uh, can the voxel data be converted to traditional points and 3D polylines for consumption on uh, traditional CAD environments like uh, Autodesk Civil 3D or Bentley's Minor Fusion? Yeah, absolutely. So really, when you think about the voxel platform, while we collect, store, process in voxels, um, and you know you have the full ability to do pretty much every calculation you can imagine within the 3D environment, within the, the voxel environment. You also have the ability to export out into pretty much any data set. So even if you wanted to export out points, we can take the centroid, for example, of all of the, the points of the voxels and convert into a point cloud. Um, but we also support a number of CAD formats as well. So you can export out into a format that allows you to manipulate the data maybe in different ways or with different workflows that you might have already. Okay, um, so uh, a comment and a question. So uh, it seems like most of the applications we talked about will focus on urban applications. So do we, is there any uh, other applications outside of urban um, that we can address? And also, do we primarily work with LiDAR-based remote sensing data or uh, do we ingest and work with other types of remote sensing data and energy? Yeah, again, great question. So obviously in this talk, we haven't really touched on the non-urban environments, um, but we, we do quite a lot. So we teamed up with a, a project called the Earth Archive, uh, where they're looking to do aerial LiDAR mapping of jungles, of forests around the world. And we use our technology for those applications. And so we can do things like uh, foliage penetration. So we can see underneath the tree canopies, remove the trees, we can detect abnormal structures or human-made structures. We can even count individual trees within a forest, for example, for carbon accounting or forestry health. So there's, there's lots of other applications there. Um, maybe it'd be a good idea we can do a webinar on, on those kind of applications at some point. But also, if you have a look at our YouTube channel, um, those, uh, the presentations we gave actually with the Earth Archive, also with NASA, um, th those are available there, and you'll be able to see some of those, uh, those examples. Yeah, I was going to su suggest going to the to the YouTube channel uh, to see some of the videos that we put together for non-urban applications. And then if people are interested, here's the archives website as well as a, a good source of information um, on some of the, the things that, that we can do. Um, what about uh, underwater volumetrics for dredging? Yeah, so in my presentation, actually on the, I think the third slide where I compare human maps and machine maps, um, there's there's a line at the bottom which we talk about what type of data, where are we collecting data, outdoors, indoors, subterranean, um, and ocean. So we are starting to collect ocean data. It's very early days. Obviously, we're doing that aerial. It's, it's not done via other platforms. 
but in principle, yes. Um, and we have a couple of partner companies which are giving us data sets, which we then voxelize and apply different um, voxel um, you know, uh, technology essentially to as well. So it's early days with, with ocean data. Absolutely, we can do it. Um, but something that we're also interested in exploring. All right. Um, how does the application perform on, um, it says on water reflected data? Is there a minimum point density requirement and can this be hosted 100% on shore? Not sure I quite understand that. Perform on water yeah. collected data? Yeah, what do we collect today? I'm not sure. Jacob, you know, I may just reach out to you or you could um, identify what you're really looking for here. Um, uh, do you post process the location data to improve its geospatial accuracy and to possibly refine historic collections? Yeah, so with our data sets, um, absolutely, you know, to get down to, I mean, resolution is one thing. But, you know, the accuracy as well, you know, absolute positional accuracy on the planet is very important. And that uses a number of techniques. So we use things, we do use corrections like RTK, PPK, and there's, there's also other um, technologies essentially that we, that we use to position uh, the data to really get it to that, that uh, degree of accuracy. So it's a whole kind of location stack um, to achieve that in, in the post process. Right. And then um, the, the solution that I talked about, uh, the 5G-based real-time mapping, near real-time mapping, um, we had talked about doing that with Verizon. Uh, the question is, will it work with other service providers, especially in other countries? Absolutely. So we're, in fact, Verizon was the, the first uh, partner and customer that we worked with to deploy uh, this solution and, and kind of show that we can do this real-time uh, concept of mapping and real-time update, which is really important. But the, the technology will work with any 5G connection. Um, the issue is 5G isn't everywhere. And even when 5G is deployed at the moment, it's kind of very throttled, you know, so it depends really where the, the 5G, the kind of technology that's being deployed as well. But if it's full 5G and we've got the bandwidth, then absolutely that will work and it can work with any network as well. And that, the rotary collection model that Jacob was talking about was the uh, helicopter for corridors. Which, oh yeah, sure. Yeah, which we yeah, worked so, with a number of people. Absolutely. We, in fact, we just finished doing an aerial scan of San Francisco using helicopter and aerial lidar and imagery, and that data drops into the model alongside the, the data that we've collected um, ourselves with with our mobile uh, sensors as well. So, absolutely, we can we can do that. Okay. Well, there are a couple more questions, but we're. Um, really out of time, we want to, want to shut this down before uh, top of the hour. So um, what I'd like to do, again, just uh, we appreciate everybody's participation. Um, on those of you that uh, had submitted additional questions, I, I'll just reach out to you directly if possible. Um, and if you have any uh, specific questions or want to engage in a conversation with us, feel free to reach out to either Peter or I at the, uh, the email addresses presented there. Or feel free to call me on my phone as well. So, again, we appreciate your uh, uh, participating with us today. Uh, we do have uh, three other uh, webinars in the series. So, uh, on Thursday, we have a, one that's focused a bit more on transportation. Next Tuesday, the 24th, on utilities. And then Thursday, on the 26th, is another overview. So, it's, it's, it's um, the, basically the same webinar. So, we'd love to have you participate in the uh, utilities or transportation, but... Um, you'll find that the, the, uh, the content of next Thursdays is going to be the same as this. So just an FYI. And again, we'll, we'll send you a guidebook that talks about the, uh, the webinars. And uh, as I mentioned, we've got some good information in there about the infrastructure bill and the opportunities for you and the geospatial community. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.